I'm going to start off by making two declarations. First of all, usually if I was going to give a talk in front of this many people, I'd dress like a grown-up. <laughs> um, I got my days mixed up. So at 11 a.m. this morning, I realized I put on quite a casual shirt with some shorts and running shoes, whereas I had to stand up in front of you all. So um, but thank you for the opportunity to speak today. The second thing I want to declare is that I have absolutely no expertise whatsoever in imaging. And the idea behind this talk, I think, when speaking with Steve, is that I was going to briefly describe for about 10 minutes the type of work that we do that looks at the way in which extreme heat and hot weather impacts human health and well-being across the human lifespan with a view on the way in which our climate is changing and try to find ways in which imaging capacity here at the University of Sydney might be able to assist with us moving forward. So my name's Ollie. I'm Professor of Heat and Health in the Faculty of Medicine and Health. I'm also Academic Director of what is now a Level 2 Research Centre called the Heat and Health Research Incubator, so FMH, have a three-tiered um, sense of structure. Uh, we were selected as the only incubator about two years ago, which is a bit of a testing ground for new research activities and centers. And um, we were recently upgraded to an impact center uh, only last week. So that's, that's good news for us. Um, the incubator serves as a multidisciplinary platform to enable people to come from a variety of different disciplines to develop comprehensive problems to these really quite um, wicked solutions that we face in the context of climate change and its impact on human health and well-being, particularly with respect to extreme heat and hot weather. I'll start off by just making an obvious statement I think that hopefully everybody in this room is on board with, is that we are most certainly live in an era of global warming. This is very evident from this particular figure here. So if we compare the temperatures that we've had over the last 30 years relative to a baseline of the middle of last century, it's clear that we're getting warmer and warmer and warmer. In fact, the last nine years are the warmest on record since records began in 1880. So it's really quite confronting data, and I really think it emphasizes the urgency with which we want to address this particular problem. Now, the issue is not necessarily an increase in average temperatures. The problems are twofold. The first one is people having to cope with chronic hot weather, and that's particularly evident in uh, people living in low resource settings, and it's also evident in lower and middle income countries, particularly in the tropical um, zone. So this is where the vulnerability really lies. But here in Australia, the places where, or the times at which this really bites are days like last Saturday, where in Western Sydney, the peak ambient temperature reached 44 degrees Celsius. It's also important to keep in mind that that's measured in the shade. So in the middle of the day, if you're out in the sun, particularly if you've got to do that because of your work or the, the, the type of job that you're undertaking, you're going to be exposed to about 15 degrees Celsius higher heat load than you would be that you think you're getting from the weather forecast. Now, this alone is not necessarily the core of vulnerability. What we see is that vulnerability is really concentrated in certain subgroups of people. And I've given, given you here a few dot points around the risk factors that we see. Now, one of the peak ones is having pre-existing chronic diseases. Coronary, coronary artery disease or any kind of cardiovascular disease is a big risk factor for heat-related mortality and morbidity, renal disease, metabolic disease, and respiratory disease. Primary aging, which links to the previous talk, is also very high on the list. Um, where there are age-related reductions in the ability to sweat, for example, when you exceed the age of 65, and they're particularly pronounced over the age of 75, unless you're particularly active and, and fit. We see a greater risk among females relative to males. And then there's also the socioeconomic factors that, that come in. People who are overly exposed to extreme heat because they don't have access to air conditioning or cool spaces are obviously at a greater risk and people who are not socially connected are also at a much greater risk. There's a big signal in the mortality and morbidity data associated with mental illnesses, particularly schizophrenia. And then there's an interaction, of course, with different types of prescription medication, even though that's not particularly well understood. So there's a lots of different risk factors here, and these have been identified by epidemiological literature. 
This is where we look at the hospital records, we look at the mortality data, and we look at associations between these negative health outcomes and these different risk factors. But it doesn't really give us an understanding, a true understanding of what the underlying mechanisms are for these uh, pathways of vulnerability. And this is where people like I come in as a physiologist, whereby we can try to understand what the mechanism is. And using that understanding of the mechanism, we can start developing evidence-based interventions, which can then be fit for purpose and, re and reduce the risk that people are exposed to and hopefully build resilience through that, that activity. So using physiological evidence to understand what's going on with the human body, which ultimately results in people ending up in the hospital or in the morgue during extreme heat events, is really important for developing public policy and changes in public practice as well. So I'm going to just briefly describe the three primary ways in which heat-related mortality and morbidity arises. Now, this is not exclusive. These are the three main ways. And I'll describe what we understand as the underlying mechanisms. But these are predominantly derived in animal models. There's very scant data in humans. And this is potentially where imaging capacity can start filling some kind of gap. Now, I know nothing about imaging, so I'm going to finish off after this slide with a few dot points, which are questions to you to ask if there are certain methods that can be used in the future to try to get at some of these deeper mechanisms in humans. So these, this uh, figure here describes the three primary pathways, as we understand them now, of heat-related mortality and morbidity. The first one is the obvious one, which is classic heat stroke. What might surprise a lot of people is that the vast majority of people that end up in the hospital or in the morgue during or following a heat wave are actually not doing so because of heat exhaustion or heat stroke. It's commonly thought that heat stroke is all that's the problem, but it's not. It's actually around about 25% of cases that are actually heat stroke. But I'll describe what heat stroke actually is. And this is information that's been developed in animal models only. So there are two ways in which we respond to a heat stress physiologically. We first redirect blood away from the body core towards the skin surface to try to support extra heat dissipation from the skin surface to the surrounding environment. And in doing so, we deprive blood flow to the gut. And when you deprive blood flow, we reduce blood flow to the gut, you reduce oxygen delivery to the cells of the gut. Now, when that's combined with high local tissue temperatures, such as 41 degrees Celsius, then the gap junctions in the gut become loose. And there's an increasing gut permeability, which results in endotoxins starting to leak out of the gut, entering the circulation. That sets off a sepsis response, which results in mass coagulation around the body, multiple organ failure, and death. So as my old PhD advisor used to say, you can't uncook an egg, and that's very true for the human body, even though some clever folks at Flinders University did figure out how to uncook an egg, but let's not worry about that today. So the root cause of that, we think, is changes in gut permeability. What are the mediating factors of that? What, why is one person more susceptible than another? How does that change with aging? We don't know. So lots of questions there. People with cardiovascular disease are number one on the risk factor list during extreme heat. Again, we're redistributing that blood away from the body core towards the skin surface in order to maintain central blood pressure. The heart's got to do more work. We've got to increase cardiac output. The venous filling pressure is reduced, particularly if we're upright, which means the only way in which we can increase cardiac output is by increasing heart rate. If you look at a heart rate trace of somebody who's passively exposed to a simulated extreme heat event in our chamber at the Susan Wiggle Health Building, it'll look like the heart trace of somebody running on a treadmill. It won't be unusual to see somebody's heart rate running at 120, 130 beats per minute when at rest in a thermal neutral environment, they're at 60 beats per minute. So they're not doing anything, they're just sitting there, but they're hot, but this massive redistribution of blood places a lot of strain on the cardiovascular system. If there's an underlying cardiovascular infirmity, coronary artery disease, for example, 
something is more likely to give. And that's what we're seeing in the epidemiological literature. And then finally, there's a role of dehydration as an aggravator of those two components that I've described before. So we sweat, and it's the evaporation of that sweat that cools us down. But if we don't adequately replenish those lost fluids, we have a reduction in blood volume, and then that results in a reduction in sweat rate, which means that your rate of heat stroke goes up quicker, your distribution of blood go is, is poor, of heat is poorer, and plus, if you've got a reduced blood volume, it means the amount of cardiovascular strain is even greater to maintain blood pressure. But also, as we have a dehydration, chronic dehydration, particularly over the course of two or three days of extreme heat exposure, it gets to the point where we have greater strain on the renal system as well. And trying to understand that is a really high priority for our physiological community. So I'll finish off. Oh, sorry, those are the three things. So I'll finish off by, and this I just came up with this when I was on the plane flying back from Dubai last week. Um, the question to you is, how can we measure things like blood flow distribution throughout different tissues of the body? Are there techniques that enable that? Are there ways in which we can measure changes in gut permeability in adults or in humans? Um, are there ways with imaging that we can measure directly oxygen consumption of the heart or blood flow distribution in the heart? Are there ways in which we can quantify renal strain? And can we use imaging to start looking? This is something that Steve and I have had an initial discussion around about how different groups may adapt differently to heat exposure. For example, we may adapt metabolically different. We do know that there's a heat acclimatization, so a physiological adaptation to the heat, which we can characterize with different physiological measurements from a heat loss perspective. But there are other questions about what also happens from a heat adaptation perspective and how that changes as a function of different physiological profiles. So those are my questions to this audience, and I'd be excited to get your thoughts and um, have further discussions about it. Thanks very much. <laughs>